In July 1900, the British Special Commissioner to Uganda, Sahari Johnston, presented a preliminary report on the Uganda Protectorate to the British Parliament. In the report, Johnston, who had been a key player in the scramble for Africa, praised Uganda's agricultural potential and preached about empowering the natives to make the protectorate self-sufficient. In his book, Uganda, an Indian Colony, 1987 to 1972, Professor Samwiri Rwangalu Nyigo, a historian, writes that Johnson opined, it is difficult to say what wealth of agricultural products might come from the country if it is cultivated by an industrious Asian race. In a deliberate move, Sir Johnston and the governors who came after him drew a blueprint for Uganda's future economy. Last month, during a public lecture in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Asian expulsion from Uganda at Makere University, Professor Sylvia Tamale, an academic and human rights activist, opined that the colonialists created a wealth divide which was racial. Even today, the economy is dominated by Asians. In their appropriation of the Ugandan economy, the British imperialists adopted the strategy of divide and rule, and positioned Indians as a buffer class between the Europeans and the Africans. The Uganda Protectorate Agency in Bombay, India, recruited technicians, clerks, policemen, soldiers, accountants, and medical staff for the government service in Uganda. Indians ended up occupying the high echelons as a planter aristocracy who presided over the natives to provide slave labor on large plantations of cotton, coffee, tea, and sugar. By 1921, the Indian Dukawalas dominated all trading centers in the protectorate to the extent that in 1928, Professor Simpson, who had been the director of agriculture in Uganda, wrote in a memo, this country, Uganda, has provided a living for a comparatively large number of Indians under more favorable conditions than they were accustomed to in India. Some speak of it as a land of their adoption and their numbers will increase. They are generally petty traders, some of whom have become relatively wealthy through trade in cotton. 20 years before the expulsion, Mukaji accurately predicted that such conditions could only result in disastrous results for the Indian community who would become scapegoats of the anger of indigenous Africans given their overt role in aiding British exploitation of their land. In stark contrast, the native bore the burden imposed on him through the hut and poll tax. However, there was a revolt in the 1940s led by Semakula Mlumba, an ex-seminarian, Augustine Kamia, and Ignatius Musazi. They began advocating for the natives to be allowed to be in charge of their produce from their gardens and the entire supply chain up to the market. In the 1949 Bataka uprising, a number of Asian properties were destroyed in Kampala and the countryside. At the dawn of independence, there was capital flight as the Indian middle class began transferring their wealth to the Western world. Madivani, Manbai, right, right, the, the, the turn of the tide. That's a very interesting book. They show you how the money was being taken, how they were taking out the money to Bermuda and other places. And then, from that money, building all over the world, India, they set up factories in India, especially in Gujarat. Uh, even the Baker Valley in the ba Lebanon, Manubai, Manubai Manduvan set up uh, a container factory there. We, the members of the annual delegates conference of the Uganda People's Congress, assembled on this 18th December 1969 in an emergency meeting in Kampala. In 1969, President Apollo Milton Obote established the Common Man's Charter with the aim of Africanizing commerce and industry. That the resources of the country, material and human, be exploited 
for the benefit of all the people of Uganda. Professor Lunyigo opines that the charter failed because Obote's underlying problem was the Buganda problem. Obote had conquered the Buganda politically in 1966, but how was he going to deny them the economic prominence they were bound to assume if we Africanized the economy? And if the Buganda assumed economic prominence, would Obote's political conquest last? In August 1971, President Idi Amin announced a review of the citizenship status of Uganda's Asian community. Amin opened the first conference with a list of Indian shortcomings. Social exclusion, a business culture rife with deception and lies, self-justifying racism, the justified petty privileges colonialism conferred on them. He then went to Indi went on to invite the same leaders to reflect as a community on the way forward, which these lead leaders, so-called leaders, refused to do at a critical juncture in the history of both the country and the Asian minority. This was akin to abdicating responsibility. One year later, in August 1972, Amin ordered the expulsion of Asians. Actually, I took this decision for the economy of Uganda. And I must make sure that every Ugandan get a fruit of independence. Since independent, actually Uganda is not yet independent, I will say that. Yeah. I want to see that the whole Kampala street is not full of Indians. It you? must be proper black and uh, administration in those shops is run by the Ugandan. Speaking at the public lecture at Makere University, Professor Mahmoud Mamdani, an academic, author and political commentator says the expulsion liberated a certain group of Asians. Something like 12,000 Asian residents of Uganda were stateless by 1971. This group, 12,000, celebrated the expulsion. For them, Amin had opened the gates of Britain most of those who were expelled were citizens of the United Kingdom. 27,000 emigrated to the UK, 6,000 emigrated to Canada, 4,500 went to India, and 2,500 went to Kenya or Pakistan. About 5,600 businesses, farms, ranches, and estates were expropriated. I made it a point to ask most people I met about their thoughts on the expulsion. Almost all responded, it was bad how Amin did it. Nobody said the expulsion was bad. This was the beginning of wisdom for me. Between 1981 and 1985, Britain gave her support to the Obote II regime on condition that Uganda's British Indians would return and repossess their properties and that there would be no nationalization of foreign holdings. About 1,000 Indians returned, sold off their properties and left again. In the 1990s, President Yoweri Museveni implored Asian investors to return to the country to fill the vacuum left by the Washington Consensus, which had imposed austerity on the country. Asians were once again given a blank check to dominate the economic space. Dr. Rajni Taylor, the former chairman of the Indian Association Uganda, believes today's business climate is similar to the one in 1972. Now, Asians contribute over 70% to the economy. I'd like to salute our Ugandan brothers and sisters that after Idi Amin, we are still being honored and we are working together from here to Woblenzi. You will see the whole place of Matuga, Boise, Kavempe is full of industries. If you leave Kampala, going towards Jinja, you see Banda, Seta, all those areas full of industrialization. And our friends, <coughs> the Chinese are also there yeah. because they have come into the business. They are a more formidable force now than they were uh, when they were expelled the first time. And uh, you know, today we have a fully liberalized foreign exchange regime.
You make the money, you take it out. You make the money, you take out. Then there's no restriction. They are given land free. What they do, they get the, the title, mortgage it in the bank, and get money. So there is very little money coming into Uganda. Most of it, it is what we give them that they mortgage, right? There have been calls to make Uganda's pre-1972 Indian community into a tribe. However, there are reservations. For instance, if you want to become a citizen, why not burn your bridges? Why hold British, Canadian or Indian citizenship? Why repatriate your earnings to other countries? If I have brought my one million dollars, should I not take it back? Anywhere in the world you put your money, you have borrowed from outside country, you have a right to take your money. And if you look at the foreign investment in Uganda today, you look at the investment they have made and the impact of the employment. So when people say that, you know, you are taking money away, I don't think that is true. The properties that are owned by Indians, many of them still charge in the dollar. How much power does a tenant have of a landlord who is an Indian? Very little powers. I have seriously been fighting that we remove this payment of rent in dollar uh, under duress. Taylor also reveals that the Indian culture restricts them to social exclusion much as they would have wanted to integrate into the Ugandan culture. The Daily Monitor reported that the Uganda Parliamentary Forum on Indian Affairs had resurrected the issue when they asked the Indian community to, and I quote, allow Ugandan men to marry Indian women so as to deepen the relationship between the two countries, end quotes. We are not Europeans where they are open-minded and they have a mixed culture and so on. The Asian are, has got the limitation, right? But His Excellency has said many times that how do you marry with an Indian who does not eat beef? If you marry, what are you going to do with her? Fifty years after the expulsion, it is the bodies of women which are being foregrounded in a discussion about the benefits of integration. With such chauvinist, misogynist, and patriarchal views, of course, relations between the two races will continue to be fraught with tension. As African men want to lay claim to the bodies of Asian women, the Asian men fight back by invoking culture and tradition. Today, the reparations of Asian property is still a sore point with some schools of thought holding that some properties have been paid for at an inflated price and repeatedly as powerful cartels in government continue to profiteer. In his book, Professor Lunigo writes that in 1973, 1975 and in 1976 to 1977, President Amin compensated Indian citizens, Indian Muslims and Uganda's British Indians respectively. Absolutely lie absolutely lie. On the list, there's only 69 properties. And those who were paid were 17. The money currently is lying somewhere, either with the UNHCR or in foreign uh, embassy or anywhere else. We have agreed with the government that we are ready to work for them if anyone has received the money and if he has reclaimed the property, we are ready to help to identify wherever he is in the world. As one of the largest owners of real property in the country, the custodian board's operations are opaque at best. And if the 2009 special report of the Auditor General is anything to go by, the board is a cesspool of corruption, patronage, and mismanagement. Asian-owned corporations are involved in land wrangles with peasants, with the corporations laying claim to huge chunks of land on which plantation farming is carried out. This is especially worrying with the high rate at which the population is growing. The land which is lying idle 
you cannot leave it and for how long? The development has to come in. If you go to Entebbe Road today and you see the development between Lubawa and Akrait and all those. Now all those lands in those days, they were growing coffee tea. You remember the multinational companies, right? So now you see how it has been developed in properties. The Milo landowners are leasing the land to the foreigners and not selling them. Isa Sechito, the spokesperson of Kampala City Traders Association and the director of trade and commerce at Private Sector Foundation Uganda, says while in writing policies on land acquisition favor everyone, the practice is different. Interview Ugandans in Inamamve. Interview Ugandans who would wish to set up facilities in Inamunkekera. Ask them how they got in the land and make an application, see whether you succeed as a local investor. So if you come when you, don't, you are not black, you can easily get free land, you can easily process a preferential treatment, you can um, access any facility that either the revenue or Minister of Finance warrants. On the incentives given to foreign investors, which disadvantage the local investor, Sechito believes Ugandan businessmen cannot compete against the Asian chain of importers, manufacturers, wholesalers, and family connections. The policies of Uganda, even outside Uganda, are weak. You suffer from South Sudan, you are cheated. You suffer even from Kenya, people burn your properties, you go to court, you even win cases. Where is the government of Uganda to come up? These people who have associations here, the Indian Association, the Chinese Association in Uganda, do one thing on their member and the whole embassy will come to you. People learn from us, people criticize also, saying why do we become rich in a very short time? And uh, people also say that uh, I don't know where these people are getting the money from. But he said the money is coming from a hard work, which I tell all my fellow Ugandans. Because people are talking now that foreigners uh, are being given a priority of each and everything. I don't think it is true. I have said to the government, and I have again emphasized this, that uh, our presidents, including uh, our Buganda Kingdom, Savasaja Kabaka, at least they should go and visit the local industry and give them a booster like the others are getting it. The question is, with Uganda's 60th independence adversary on the horizon, is the country truly independent with its entire business and financial or banking sectors in foreign hands? This is especially so when native banks were shut down and a number of domestically owned businesses folded as a result of high taxes and overhead costs. I don't want to mention people's names of companies that have started, tried to survive, but because of small misunderstandings between them and the revenue authorities, completely shut down and they are all for, uh, local owned. Sembule, uh, Sebuko was a manufacturer, has started a very big facility and many Ugandans were watching Mr. Sivalamu, had he to succeed, would now have over 100 facilities, same as his in Inajana Kumbi, they are collapsed. A small misunderstanding, ask for a wave of some kind, they heaped the taxes, sold off the factory to Randis, who is now making wonders in the same field there. Today, in Uganda's free market economy, the Chinese are the new Asians on the block, formidable competitors for raw materials and land who are free to trade anywhere in the country and at whatever level, including petty trade. Under the impetus of perceived benefits of foreign investment, the movers and shakers of Uganda's economy are about 3,000 Ugandan Asians, 30,000 Indian immigrants, and about 10,000 Chinese.
any foreign direct investor can come here and do business with all the incentives, the customs procedure codes, the deferment of VAT, the deferment, the exemption of withholding tax, all go to them without any shareholding from the local community. No country world over usually allows this. It is a deliberate effort by the Chinese government when you export goods to Uganda and you are Chinese, there is a duty remission. All the tax that you have paid at the exit will be reimbursed back to you. In other words, the goods that you sell to Uganda and the Ugandan importing them from China will never be competitive. Although the growth of many countries has been due to their capacity to integrate immigrants, the Asian question remains one of the polarizing factors of this country. And you have heard in South Africa the capture, the Guptas capturing the, the, southern, the, 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 the state in South Africa. They don't have guns, but they have the money. And they are very influential. And they have done something about them now. But uh, you, you hear of state capture. That's what the Indians are doing here. They are capturing the state once again. And of course, uh, FDI, uh, foreign direct investment, whom does it devolve? And is there any difference where, whether the Indian is here or not to the, to the man in the village? Whether <laughs> the Indian is here, he, they grow sugar, but how many people in the villages take sugar? How, how many can afford it? this? I'm just giving you an example. The new Asians are not considered Ugandans, even if some of them may hold Uganda passports. For President Museveni, they are investors, not citizens. In the African imagination, they have become the prototype of a mercenary community. For the Asians, they live on sufferance, always on guard, never at peace. We may ask ourselves, in whose interest? is this state of affairs. Certainly not in the interest of those identified as Asians, nor of the people of this country. The question merits further reflection. So, as Professor Lunigo would have us believe, is Uganda an Indian colony? Well, it might seem that way, unless the government goes out of its way to protect the rights of Ugandan businesses and gives them incentives as it does to foreign businesses. Gillian Nantume, NTV Panorama.